Thank you so much. I'll go up here so you can see me because I'm not a big guy. Um, not a lot of Cubs fans uh, in the house tonight, I'm guessing, since you're here with me tonight. I appreciate it. Um, well, we're going to travel back in time a little bit tonight and uh, take you back to Chicago, 1927 or so. Um, back then, it had, only, it had been about 25, 20 years since the Cubs had won a World Series. Uh, if you can imagine waiting 20 years, um, nobody thought it could go on much longer than that. Um, I was saying, if, if you would thought about driving from Chicago down to Kankakee the way I did um, this afternoon, it might have taken you a whole day. Um, if you'd come into Chicago to uh, come listen to me talk about Al Capone, and back then it was actually common for people to have public addresses, to have people gather by the thousands to listen to discussions about the big issues of the day. And, and the crime problem in Chicago in the 1920s was one that people might have gathered to talk about. So imagine if you had driven up to uh, Chicago to hear me speak tonight, um, it would have taken you not just half a day or so to get there, but then another couple of hours just to get from the south side of the city into the loop because there were no traffic lights yet, um, no stop signs, and um, you can see the kind of car you would have been driving. And um, there would have been a lot of big issues to talk about in the 1920s and in the days of Al Capone. Um, this was the age of prohibition, and um, let's see if I've got this working. Oh, I mentioned uh, my Cubs joke was supposed to be time to the slide. I haven't used this slideshow in a while. I've been talking about the birth control pill. I've been talking about um, Muhammad Ali. So my, if, if I get a little distracted and I start talking about Joe Frazier in the middle of this thing, you'll, you'll excuse me, but um, that was for my Cubs joke. Um, prohibition was the la law of the land in the 1920s, and uh, by 1927 or so, uh, the, the era that I'm going to focus on tonight, there were already a lot of people saying that it was time to repeal this law. And uh, just to give you a little background on prohibition, this was something that really came about um, out of the suffrage movement when women got the right to vote. They began flexing their muscles and, and pushing for more reforms. And one of the things they, they thought about is cutting back on alcohol. Alcohol was a huge problem in this country. And, and the prohibition movement really got its strength going uh, during World War I when we were th talking about sacrificing. We were talking about cutting back and sobering up. So it was more popular at the time. Um, it, was, it was reasonable to introduce the idea of, of becoming a more disciplined, more sober nation. And women in particular um, were behind prohibition for, among many, there were religious reasons, of course, but they also because um, they were often being um, attacked, raped by their husbands who were coming home drunk every night. Um, people were drinking on, on their lunch breaks, so businesses thought it might be a good idea to try cracking down on the amount of alcohol um, that was being served. And when this law passed, when, when the constitutional amendment was passed, the belief was that Americans would accept it. There was no plan for enforcement of this law. You're laughing. You should be laughing. Um, because in America, we have always made law. Every other constitutional amendment is designed to enhance liberty, to give us more rights, more freedom. And here's the only constitutional amendment that's ever been passed to restrict our freedoms, to cut back on what we as, as Americans can do. And when it became law in the 1920s, it was immediately terribly unpopular. Not just because, hey, we, we liked our booze, of course we did, but also because the times had changed. World War I was over. The economy was beginning to boom. We started seeing things happening in the 20s that we never would have imagined before a, de a decade prior. We see people going out late at night to jazz clubs. We see women smoking cigarettes and cutting their hair short and applying for jobs. Um, so it's a much more wild um, time and people aren't looking to sober up anymore. They're looking to have a good time. So prohibition it becomes incredibly unpopular. And um, just at the moment that it's passed, this young man moves to Chicago. Um, this is a, a very familiar portrait. This is a picture of him you've probably never seen before. This is, um, unless you've read my book, which I hope you have. Um, and if you haven't, it's for sale in the back of the room and I'll be signing copies. Um, but this is the earliest known photo of Al Capone. That's him in the middle. Um, it's, he's, he grew up in Brooklyn. I'm going to tell you a little bit about his background. Um, you'll, 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 oh yeah, I'm sorry. If I'm blocking your view. I'll move over to the side a little bit. Follow me, cameraman. Um, is this better? Okay. Um, that's Al Capone in the middle. He grew up in Brooklyn. Um, he and I have a lot in common, actually. We both grew up in Brooklyn. We were both born in Brooklyn. 
We both started losing our hair as teenagers. You can see he's losing his hair a little bit there. We both ruthlessly destroy our competition. Anybody who gets in our way has to be crushed. Um, but Capone was one of nine children, um, born to the, uh, his, the son of, a, of, a, of an Italian immigrant, mother and father. His father was a barber. And there was nothing in his early life to suggest that he would lead a life of crime. Uh, like a lot of kids from big immigrant families growing up poor, he dropped out of school early. And like a lot of immigrant kids growing up poor, he went to work to try to help raise money for his family. Um, so yeah, a lot of kids at this, you know, when they were in their teens, ran the streets. Um, the Marx Brothers grew up in New York, similar neighborhoods, almost the exactly same time as Al Capone, but they didn't turn to a life of crime. So, you know, Capone could have gone into vaudeville, could have done a lot of different things. Um, so why did this guy end up becoming the man I would argue is, is our nation's most notorious criminal? Um, and in, over the course of our time here together, I want to try to um, make a couple of key points. Um, the first is that a lot of people think they know about Al Capone, and they don't. That we've become blinded, we've become... Um, anesthetized by the movies and the TV shows that we've seen about gangsters, and we've lost sight of the truth of who these people really are and what they did. Some of the things you know about Al Capone are true. A lot of them are false. Um, if you think that he was a ruthless psychopath, you're wrong. He was a, he was a complicated guy who was certainly a violent criminal, um, but he was also um, a, a fairly smart guy who cared a great deal about public opinion of him, cared a great deal about his family, uh, if you think that Al Capone was taken down um, for, his, for, vi for violent crimes, you're mistaken. You may know that he went to jail instead for income tax evasion. If you think that Elliot Ness was the man who put him away, you're wrong again. It was an almost completely unknown uh, lawyer from Chicago named George E.Q. Johnson. And um, finally, if you think Capone was responsible for the Valentine's Day Massacre, I strongly suspect that you're wrong, and we can talk about that a little bit later on, too. And well, I'll leave time for questions uh, when we're finished here today. So um, Al Capone arrived in New York uh, in 1921, just as uh, Prohibition was becoming the law. He got his start in crime in, in New York, actually, in Brooklyn, working at a, at a bar called the Harvard Inn on Coney Island. When he was a teenager, uh, out of school, he first went to work as a pin setter in a bowling alley. Um, then later as a box cutter. He got a job as a dishwasher at this place called the Harvard Inn. And the Harvard Inn was definitely not an Ivy League establishment. This was a rough, rough place run by this man, Frankie Uale, who Americanized his name and called himself Frankie Yale. And Frankie Yale's idea of a joke was to call his business the Harvard Inn. Um, and it was a place where you could go to get a drink. It was a place you could go to get a prostitute. Um, also, if you needed somebody killed, you can come and see Frankie, because he sat at a table by the window, and um, he took care of some serious business. Uh, he ran the ice rackets in Brooklyn, and uh, if you tried to sell ice without paying him off, tried to get in, you know, do business in one of, on his route, you got an ice pick in the back, uh, or if, in the knee, if he was feeling like he was in a good mood. Um, so Capone goes to work for Frankie Yale, and works his way up from dishwasher to uh, bartender, to bouncer, and um, it's also at the Harvard Inn that um, Capone acquires the scars on the side of his face. On the left side, three scars. He was working one night and was hitting on a girl in the bar. Um, Capone, by the way, would always tell the story that he got those scars on the battlefields of uh, Europe in World War I, but in fact, he, uh, he was trying to hit on a girl. The girl's brother, the girl told him to get lost. Capone didn't give up so easily, and the girl's brother slashed Capone with a knife, um, said that he was aiming for his neck, trying to kill him, but he was a little drunk and missed and got his cheek instead. Um, I always say that if, uh, if the guy hadn't been so drunk, um, my book would have been like 12 pages long because Capone would have been dead at the age of 17. Um, but Capone survived the attack and earned the nickname Scarface, which he, uh, as you can imagine, was not terribly fond of. Um, he um, also met this man in New York, uh, Johnny Torrio, who was a gangster in, in New York, in Brooklyn, uh, one of the more powerful guys, and moved to Chicago. Um, just before Prohibition became the law, and told Capone, if you ever need a job, you ever want to move up, pick up and move to Chicago, come see me. Well, it turns out Capone got into a tr little trouble with the law. He was a suspect in a murder case. He had also gotten his girlfriend pregnant and decided maybe this was a good time to move to Chicago. So uh, he took his girlfriend with him. They got married. That was the only child they ever had. Um, and while his wife uh, raised the child, Capone 
went to work for Johnny Torrio. Um, again, prior to Prohibition, just a, just a thug really, just working as a bouncer in a brothel in a bar. Um, no reason to expect that he was destined for greatness at all. Nothing about this man uh, marked him for um, greatness. He ended up working at this place, the Four Deuces Saloon, uh, 2222 South Wabash. I'm, I'm happy I remember these details. That's good. I'm th you know, two books on, so uh, I haven't talked, haven't talked about this in a while. So uh, senility is not kicking in yet. I can keep my fingers crossed. Um, this is um, the Four Deuces. And Capone would stand out in front trying to get customers to come on in because there were a lot of bars. This is just south of the Levy District where a lot of the prostitutes and a lot of the brothels operated. And um, the biggest player in town was uh, Big Jim Colosimo, who had a place just up the street from here. Um, some of you are nodding like you've been there. Uh, I don't think so. It was a, a, it, uh, Big Jim got knocked off um, pretty soon after Capone arrived, and a lot of people suspected that Capone may have been the hitman. Uh, we don't really know. We do know that Capone was responsible for a couple of murders, at least early in his career, um, but he was never arrested, never uh, charged with any kind of crimes. Um, it was here, when Prohibition began, that really life began to change, not just for Capone, but for a lot of thugs working in the city of Chicago, because suddenly, um, when you take away an industry the size of the alcohol industry, this is one of the, I, I, again, maybe a little fuzzy on the details. I'm, it was one of the five or 10 biggest industries in the country, the, the, the sale of alcohol, alcoholic beverages. You take that away, assuming that demand does not dry up, there's a great opportunity there. And these, this opportunity presented itself to people like Capone, like Torrio, who were not experienced businessmen, but they were willing to take risks. Why were they willing to take risks? Because there was enormous money to be, to be made, and also because it was actually, when you think about it, a step up from what they were doing before. If you're working as a bartender and a bouncer, and suddenly you can become a distributor of beer, um, a manufacturer of beer, you're not only making more money, you're actually getting into what seems like a more legitimate enterprise. You don't have, and, and certainly the money involved makes the risk worth um, taking. So very soon, Capone is able to make enough money to buy a house. Um, this is a... Uh, South Prairie, 73-something hundred South Prairie. Um, and um, he, he's um, earning enough money that he can move his entire family to Chicago to stay with him. So suddenly he's got his, his mother, his wife, his son, his mother, his sister, a couple of his brothers all living in this house with him. And he's the main breadwinner. He's able to put his brothers to work in the organization. But he's still only maybe number three, number four in the uh, organization under Johnny Torrio. And um, he's a young man, he's, he's you know, 21, 22 years old. Um, still nothing to suggest that this is a guy who's going to become a legend. And, and what is it that makes the difference? I think this is really a key question to think about. Um, getting ahead of myself a little bit, but certainly nothing to suggest that you know, this is a guy who's gonna have his picture on the front of magazine covers. Um, but, but let me talk about why Capone becomes Capone a little bit. Um, the main impediment to doing business, um, Johnny Torrio is very smart. He teaches Capone um, that this is a professional operation. We have to behave like professionals. We have to behave like businessmen now. And that means we are going to try to um, outsource things. We're going we're to hire people to make our barrels. We're going to hire people to make our booze. We're going to hire people to make, you know, to, to make beer, to make uh, gin. Um, to distribute it to all these bars. And of course, there's some muscle involved too, because if you're selling beer to a bar, someone else tries to sell beer to that bar, you gotta make sure they know that there's a threat, that there's a risk. You do business with me, or you're in trouble. And people who come in and try to sell beer on, the t on your turf, they get in trouble too. But Torrio tries to preach to Capone that the best approach is to try to make peace. He also teaches Capone that it's really smart to invest your profits. Don't get greedy, don't spend it all. And one of the key ways that they decide to invest their profits is a form of insurance. They buy police officers. They buy politicians. They buy judges and lawyers so that it's almost impossible for Al Capone to get arrested. In fact, one day he's out driving drunk and he smashes into a trolley car and he takes out his gun and starts waving it at the trolley car saying, I'm gonna shoot you you know, calling him a bunch of names. The police come, they, they pull him in, they, they take him to jail, and Capone's just laughing, saying, I'm going to be out of this jail before you can even finish your paperwork. 
Um, this, this is a joke. I got this town fixed. He's not even in charge yet, but he knows that Johnny Torrio has spread the bribes around. And sure enough, the cops let him go. It's the first time Capone's name ever appears in the newspapers, by the way. And they misspell it. But it's the beginning of Capone's um, fame. And he's able to pull this, pull this off. Um, Johnny Torrio eventually gets um, shot in the face and decides to retire. And he's shot by one of the rival gangs, like I mentioned. This is really the, the biggest threat to their operation, to their business, is the competition. Um, if you can kill off your competition, if there's no threat of getting arrested, it's very easy to take out a gun and just knock off somebody who's, who's taking money out of your pocket. So when Torrio um, decides to retire, Al Capone becomes the man in charge. He's only 24 years old at this point. And he's running a massive operation. So the IRS would later estimate that he was making millions a year. I suspect that they grossly exaggerated that. But this was an organization that was probably doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year at a time when that would translate to millions of dollars today, certainly, but not you know, tens of millions. We're talking about you know, a very loose-knit organization of, of, of bars and, and brothels, um, casinos. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of money, a lot of responsibility for a guy of this age. And Capone um, really is able to pull it off for quite a while. But something happens in 1926, and this is both the key, I think, to understanding him as a person and the key to um, why he becomes so famous. 1926, a um, couple of guys from Capone's gang are out driving around, and, and they, they see some guys who, from a rival gang who have been selling beer and where they're not supposed to be selling it, and they start shooting. They start shooting at these other gangsters, and they kill them, and it turns out there's also a guy in the car named Billy McSwiggin, who's a state prosecutor, state's attorney. And there are certain rules of etiquette in the gang world. Uh, killing other gangsters is okay. Um, there were approximately 75 gang murders a year in Chicago in the 1920s, um, which seems like small potatoes compared to what's going on, unfortunately, today on the south side of Chicago. But out of those roughly 75 a year, would anybody care to guess how many over the course of a decade resulted in prosecutions, in, in convictions, guilty verdicts? Zero, yeah, there were none. Um, in, in part because they had the system so nicely greased, but also because juries tended not to want to convict bootleggers because most jurors were drinking men. So, um, but, in, but when you kill a state prosecutor, you've crossed the line. You've created a problem for yourself. And suddenly, Capone's name was appearing in papers all over the country. And suddenly, the mayor of Chicago, who was also uh, you know, bought off by Capone, was saying, that's enough. We have, to, we have to find out who did this, and that person's going to jail. All the fingers point to Capone. Not that he necessarily pulled the trigger, but that he, these were his men involved in this thing. So Capone disappears. He takes the summer off. He goes to Michigan, house on Round Lake, enjoys himself, enjoys with his wife, with his mistress, um, and he has a decision to make. This is really the crossroads. This is really the key moment in his life, I would argue. Um, he could retire. He's made enough money. He's taking care of his family. He could buy a restaurant. He could move to, back to New York. He could move out of the country. He could set up in California, start a legitimate business, maybe a vineyard. I don't know. Um, but he doesn't. After taking the summer off, he decides that he's going to come back to Chicago and not just come back and go back into business, but he calls a press conference and announces that he's coming back to Chicago and announces that he's going to make a statement. He's going to do it on the front steps of the police station. Now think about this for a second. What's one thing that most career criminals have in common? Besides guns. Um, they, they don't call attention to their criminal activities, right? They try to quietly get away with the crimes they're committing. But Capone is going to call a press conference. And this is, you have to understand a little bit of context. Um, I was a bad history student. I don't like the history lessons. But just understand a little bit of what's going on in the 1920s. You have people sitting on flagpoles. You have Babe Ruth getting famous, not just for hitting home runs, but for being a, a carousing, drunken, doing vaudeville in the off season. You've got um, Lucky Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic. Um, this is the age of the American celebrity is born in the 1920s. This is when America really becomes the wild, carefree America that we know and think of today. This is, you know, 
those guys sitting on flagpoles were the very first reality shows, right? Um, this is where it all began for America. We went from being this very serious Puritan nation to being over the top, to being wild and crazy. And it begins in the 1920s. And there were business books being written saying, to, it's not enough anymore just to be a good businessman. You have to be a personality. You have to be a star. To be a successful entrepreneur, you have to develop your own cult of personality. And these are the, some of the best-selling books of the 1920s. And it's quite possible to imagine Capone reading one of these and thinking, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm a businessman. And the public wants what I'm giving them. So I'm going to be upfront about it. I'm, nobody likes prohibition anyway. That's my business, to give them the beer that they want. I'm a hero. And that's how he sees himself. He calls a press conference, and he goes and stands on the steps of the police department, and he says, I'm here to answer all of your questions. You want to talk to uh, Billy McSwiggin? I'm happy to talk about Billy McSwiggin. I didn't kill the kid. Why would I kill him? He was on my payroll. The guy was working for me, and he was doing a good job. So now he's not just admitting that he's a criminal. He's admitting that he pays off public officials, and he's saying it like it's a good thing. And it's, it's mind-boggling when you think about it, but that's what was going on in the 1920s. And Capone begins to embrace this notion of celebrity, that he can be the gangster, the popular gangster. And I would argue that that, more than anything else, is why we know Al Capone's name, and we don't know the name of the gangster who ran Cleveland. Or, well, maybe some of you do. Um, I used to. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, we don't know the name of the gangster who ran Los Angeles, right? These guys are not celebrities because they continued to do their bootlegging quietly. And Capone called attention to himself. And these other gangsters would, would actually give him a hard time. They'd say, what are you doing? You're making it harder for all of us. You're, you're just going to bring down the law. But Capone didn't care. He liked it. And he really believed that he could have the public on his side. And sure enough, by 27, 28, you start to see magazines like this appearing. People would come to Chicago, they would drive in from out of town, you, you know, you'd come, if you lived out here, or if you lived in Iowa even, you'd drive to Chicago to buy a car, because you could go on one street, Motor, motor Row, and um, you know, there are dozens of car dealerships, you can, you can look at all the, the models um, and, and pick out the car, and if you're coming into Chicago to buy your new car, your, your neighbors in Iowa would say, well, be careful, watch out for that Capone, don't get any bullet holes in your new car. And you'd, and you'd pick up a magazine like this for 50 cents, which was a pretty good investment back then. You know, it's probably, you know, five or, five or seven dollars worth uh, now with inflation. Um, and Capone became this, this phenom, this public figure. And he got away with it for a long time. He was giving interviews to um, gossip columnists, not just like the Chicago, you know, reporters. Let's see. Um, he was posing for pictures you know, with, his, with his kids um, by, his, by the pool. Um, he really thought that, 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 that he could do this. And um, even reporters from, uh, from Hollywood would come to town if they were passing through Chicago. Well, who's the most famous person in Chicago that a gossip columnist would want to interview? Al Capone. And they'd call him up and he'd answer his phone and they'd say, he'd say, yeah, come on over. I'll be happy to talk to you. He did an interview with Cosmopolitan magazine, which is my favorite interview of all time for Capone. Imagine, Cosmo calls. And Capone says, sure, yeah, I'm happy to talk to you. And, and he gives this long interview, and he talks about his motivations. He talks about, he's clearly just begging to be understood. It, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking in a way. He says, um, I'm just trying to do better for my kids, for my kid. I'm just trying to give him the opportunities that I never had. I want my boy Sonny to be able to go to college. I don't want him to have to be to work as hard as I did. I, I don't want him to have to go into this kind of work. I, and I don't want him to be a politician either, by the way, because that's, that's even worse than what I do. I'd like him to be a doctor or a lawyer. And uh, this reporter from Cosmo was so comfortable with Capone, so unthreatened. At one point, Capone calls his wife in and says, look at the gray hairs it gives her to, to, to see me having to do this kind of work, you know, to, see, to, to have to worry about me coming home every night because of the violence. I just want all these gangs, all these bootleggers to get along. There's plenty of money for all of us to be made. Um, and the, this reporter is so comfortable with Capone that she says, well, what about the fact that you have to kill people? I mean, can you imagine having the guts to ask Al Capone that question? But she asks. And, and Capone answers. He says, well, maybe I think that God sees it different than the way the law books see it. 
Maybe God understands that I'm just trying to take care of my family, and I'm trying to protect myself. I mean, what good am I to them if somebody kills me? And if I have to kill somebody first before they can kill me, I don't know. Uh, it seems okay. And, and he says, my favorite quote, he says, I got to believe there's worse people in the world than me. Now, if you watch The Sopranos, you can just picture like uh, Tony Soprano saying that to Dr. Melfi, right? He's, tr he's trying to get his head around this. Like he's trying to find a way to, to justify this. I, and, and, he's, and he really wants to believe that he's not a bad guy. It, it really makes you kind of feel for him, right? I mean, it's not just me. I'm not the only softy here. Um, and, and, he's, and he's pulling this off. He's pulling off this high wire act. He actually manages to get a truce in late 1927 with the other gangs, and they agree to stop killing each other. And he brags to these reporters, he says, for the first time, I don't have to sleep with a gun under my pillow. I can go home to my wife and kids and, and stay there for a few days in a row instead of having to be on the run all the time. He's really feeling like, you know, this is possible. So I wanted to tell you about this so that you don't have this in your head when you think of Al Capone. Don't let De Niro and uh, Robert Stack get in your head and think that you know Capone from these movies. I want you to Keep in mind that this is a real person who is living through real times in America when we've never had a time like this before where the law is being so widely flouted that people feel like it's okay to break this law and Capone is able to justify himself because of that. Because he feels like, as, as he said, you know, on, on Michigan Avenue when they serve the stuff on a silver tray, it's called hospitality, but when I deliver it, it's a crime? How does that make sense? So this is what I want you to understand. Um, and Capone's able to get away with this. There was another slide here somewhere. There was a Valentine's Day Massacre slide here. It's been, it's been banned because it's too violent. <laughs> Kankakee has, you know, standards after all. Um, he's getting away with all of this until the Valentine's Day Massacre. September 14th, 1929. Just gruesome. I, I can't show you. Um, seven men are killed in a garage on Clark Street. And this really changes things for Capone. Why? As I said, 75 people a year are getting killed. Why should these seven men in the garage make a difference? One, it's because seven's a lot at one time. Two, there are a couple innocent civilians there. They're, they're not all gangsters. There's an optometrist there who just like to hang out with gangsters. There's a mechanic who happened to be working in the garage fixing trucks. Three, the tabloid newspaper has really begun become popular in the, by, the, by 1927 and, by 1929, excuse me, and these gruesome photos that I cannot show you are appearing on the front pages of newspapers now, and Americans are seeing photos of these guys lying in the garage with their brains next to their heads, with blood pouring out on the, on the concrete, and it's horrifying, and this man, Herbert Hoover, oh, where'd it go? There he is. Um, is elected president. He's the first man ever to run for president in the United States talking about crime control. Because crime had always been a local issue, not a national one. But prohibition changed that. And it felt like the laws were just being flouted, that we, Americans had lost respect for the system of justice. And Herbert Hoover said he was going to do something about that. And at the same time, the Valentine's Day massacre is horrifying people. And Hoover says, He's not only, he's a very, Herbert an, Herbert Hoover's an engineer, he's a brilliant man, he's very much an administrator, he's not a, you know, Teddy Roosevelt kind of rah-rah guy. He wants to fix problems, he's a very good bureaucrat, he wants to fix the justice system, and he's got a very long, complicated plan for how he's going to do that. Um, but he also is smart enough to know that he needs to get the public's attention, and he's going to do that by going after Al Capone. He's going to make Capone an example. He's going to show the country that we're going to be tough on the law, on crime. We're going to enforce the prohibition law. He says, if you don't like it, let's vote to change it. But until we do that, we're going to enforce it. And people like Al Capone are not going to be allowed to corrupt our justice system. They're not going to be able to walk away from a murder of seven people. Now, as I said earlier, I don't think Capone had anything to do with the Valentine's Day Massacre. But because it went unsolved, because um, police couldn't figure out anybody who might have been responsible, partly because police may have been responsible for it, um, they just immediately began to blame it on Al Capone because he was, the, he was out there laughing about how he killed his rivals. He was, um, he, was a, he was a criminal and he was open about it, so it was easy to assume that Capone must have had something to do with the Valentine's Day Massacre. 
but they can't prove that. They can't even prove that he's bootlegging. Herbert Hoover every morning plays, plays Hoover ball on the lawn of the White House. It's kind of like uh, Newcomb. You remember Newcomb from Jim uh, when you were a kid? They throw this heavy ball, a medicine ball, across the net, and you have to catch it. And he played every morning, even in the winter, with his cabinet. And every morning he would say, what are we doing about Capone? I want every agency that can possibly work on Capone to, to work on taking him down. And the prohibition enforcement is a joke. They, they, they can't charge him with prohibition-related uh, crimes. So the IRS begins working on, on building a case, trying to prove that Capone didn't pay his taxes. And George E.Q. Johnson, the prosecutor uh, for the Northern District of Illinois, decides that the best chance he has is to go after Capone on income tax evasion. Um, and it's a little bit embarrassing, to be honest, because um, when you think about it, you're trying to show that you're tough on crime, and, and here's a guy who's admitting that he sells booze, admitting that he kills his, uh, his enemies, and the best you can do is try to build an income tax evasion case against him. And then it gets worse from there. Now, I'm not going to give away everything that's in the book, because if you haven't read it yet, you will, I hope. Um, but even the income tax case against Capone is terribly weak. Um, they can't prove that he has any income, because Capone didn't put his name on anything. Um, these are the uh, government agents. This is an example of a book. This is one of the few um, clues they found that actually had the name um, Al on it, but not even his name. Um, it was a bank ledger, and these IRS agents uh, found very little to tie Capone to the organization, to tie him to the money, and partly that was because um, Capone's own men didn't trust him with the money. He spent everything he got his hands on, and um, also because Capone was smart enough to know that you don't want to have a checking account, you don't want to have ledgers that show where you're making your money, because then you're going to leave a paper trail. So the case against Capone ended up coming down to um, finding evidence that he spent money. It was really all circumstantial evidence. And it was very weak. And at the last minute, uh, George E.Q. Johnson writes a letter to the Attorney General of the United States saying, I think we ought to offer him a deal. I think we ought to offer him a plea bargain because we got really nothing on him. We could take this to trial and lose. He knew that it was very difficult to convict bootleggers because, as I mentioned earlier, jurors like to drink. And Capone was a hero to the drinking man. So George E.Q. Johnson tried to make a deal. And I should tell you that um, one of the things I'm most proud of with this book is that, you know, you think you know everything about Capone. And uh, I found thousands of pages of documents, George E.Q. Johnson's personal papers that had never made it to the National Archives, had never been published in another book. Um, George E.Q. Johnson's son, George E.Q. Johnson Jr., thank God for that Q because it made him easy to find, um, was 95 years old and living in Indiana, and I called him up and said, whatever happened to your dad's papers? I can't find them at the National Archives. And he said, oh, I gave them to a college professor 20 years ago, and the college professor never did anything with them. I called this college professor. He said, oh, God, they're just cluttering up my office. I, they, I don't know what to do with them anymore. I was going to write a book, but I never did. You want them? I said, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind uh, taking a look. I drive out to Nebraska to visit this professor, and I start pulling down these boxes. And, you know, if you do my kind of work, this is like, you know, hitting a home run in the, in the ninth inning of the last game of the World Series. Anybody have a Cubs score, by the way? One nothing Cubs? All right, thank you. Um, and that's how I felt um, finding these boxes. In these boxes are... Um, original papers from the Capone investigation, wiretaps of the Capone gang, um, all of it on this beautiful old yellow paper that nobody had touched or seen since the 1920s and 30s. And in these papers, George E.Q. Johnson says that he really is not sure he can win this case. And it goes to trial. Uh, so, so Johnson offers Capone a settlement. Capone takes the deal, two and a half years. And he goes out that night celebrating with his pals, bragging about how he's, he made a deal, he's only going to do two and a half years, he'll be in and out of jail so fast you won't know it, and he'll be out back in business before his kid even goes off to college. It's going to be great. The judge gets wind of Capone celebrating and says, no, deal's off. We're going to trial. And Capone gets completely railroaded at the trial. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I'm, I don't mean to, want to sound like I'm defending the man. I already said that he probably had nothing to do with the Valentine's Day Massacre. I'm not making him out, him out to be, you know, America's... Uh, leading citizen, but he got, he got a raw deal at this trial, and um, his lawyers blew it, too. He, he, he hired his usual lawyers. He hired the guys who knew how to fix a case at City Hall, knew how to fix a case 
at, in Cook County, but had no idea how to handle it, the IRS and no idea how to handle a tax case. So Capone gets sentenced to 11 years in prison for income tax evasion. At the time, the longest sentence in America anyone had ever been given for income tax evasion was three years. So clearly he was being scapegoated. Clearly he was being used as an example. And, and it, in many ways it worked um, because the, the gang in Chicago fell apart without him. The, the booze business became splintered, um, disorganized, and very soon prohibition was, was, was rescinded. And Capone went away and did um, his first few years in the Atlanta penitentiary, then Alcatraz, as, as most of you probably know, if you've ever been to Alcatraz, they make Capone the star of the show out there on the tour. Um, while in prison, he was um, diagnosed with syphilis, and the syphilis, uh, which he had probably acquired when he was just a teenager, had now started to destroy his brain. So by the time he was released from prison, he got out a little bit early for good behavior. Um, he was still a young man. He was only 35. I mean, he went away um, when he was only about 30 years old. And you think about that. Think about the arc of his career. Think about how famous he is today. And in these pictures, you know, he looks like a much older man. Um, there's a picture of him with his son. Uh, while he was on trial, so confident he was still going to ball games. Um, when he thought he was going away for a while, he tried to make a deal with his, uh, to, to sell his autobiography. Little um, interesting trivia about the, the, the book publishing world and tells you how hard it is to make a living in the book publishing world uh, these days and in, in, even in 1931. This is a letter Al Capone wrote to a ghostwriter, a Chicago newspaper man named Howard Vincent O'Brien, authorizing him to write Capone's autobiography, to ghostwrite it. And Howard Vincent O'Brien went to New York and s went to meet with publishers and said, I am authorized to write Al Capone's autobiography. How much will you pay us? And nobody wanted to publish it because Capone wanted to write about what a good dad he was and what a good uh, businessman he was. And he didn't want to talk about the violent details of his work. So his bi autobiography was never published. Um, and um, Capone went away, and by the time he got out of jail, he was really a wreck. He was, uh, his mind was destroyed by the syphilis. Um, he's, he lived for another 10 years after prison, but did almost nothing in that time besides uh, sit around by the pool and, and uh, put his line in the water, try to go fishing in the uh, canal behind his house in Miami, and um, never got in any trouble again. And, um, you know, I think that the, the point of this, what I, the reason I'm trying to humanize him, it's not to make him out to be a good guy, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up here and take your questions after, after this. Um, the point is not to try to humanize him. It's, it's not to try to turn him into a hero by any stretch of the imagination. It's to try to turn him into a human being. I think um, those of us who love history, those of us certainly who, who write history, have a duty to undo some of the damage that TV and the movies have done. I enjoy the TV and the movies, but... Um, they do us a disservice because to understand Capone, you need to understand his times, you need to understand how a, a, how a normal person can enter, end up with this very extraordinary life. And it's not because he was a psychopath, it's not because he was born with a bad streak, it's because he had this ambition, he had this opportunity, and he had this willingness to break the law, and he had this mean streak. It's the combination of all those forces. So I want you to leave with one thing tonight, if you leave with only one thing, um, I want you to remember that quote from Al Capone when he said, you know, I got to believe there's worse fellows in the world than me. There were worse fellows. There were also better fellows. But to understand somebody who becomes as famous and as two-dimensional as Al Capone has become, you need to go back and think about the fact how he thought of himself a little bit. That's not the only way to think about him, but you have to factor in the fact that somebody could rise to that level of infamy could become the most notorious criminal in American history and could still wish to justify, could still think of himself as being not the worst fellow in the world. So um, I thank you tonight for coming. I thank you for reading the book, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Go back to, go back to that happy picture. Yes, sir. Well, I think he, um, he, he, he committed several acts of, of violence, and, and I think to commit a murder, you have to be a violent man. I do think he probably personally committed a couple of murders, at least, um, in his younger days. When he rose to power, he tended to um, outsource those jobs. Uh, he had men who were, uh, who were paid to do the dirty work for him. But early in his career, he almost certainly committed a couple of murders himself, and he certainly authorized others. So uh, I think he, he certainly qualifies as a violent man. Yes, ma'am. 
Oh, good question. What happened to Sonny? Um, Sonny um, stayed out of trouble. He went to college. He went to uh, Notre Dame for, I think, a year, and then he went to the University of Miami, and um, he ended up working at a restaurant in Miami. He and his wife, he and his mother were host and hostess at a uh, popular restaurant in Miami, and he never really got in trouble. You know, Capone's other, some of Capone's other relatives did remain active. Uh, you know, Capone set them up in mob-related businesses, um, but Sonny never did. He stayed straight. He, um, he got in trouble once uh, for shoplifting, and it was really sad because he, um, because he was Al Capone's son. It made national, international news. It was in every newspaper in the country, you know, hugely embarrassing, and he changed his name after that. And, but he, he married and had four kids of his own. Some of his uh, daughters are, are still alive, uh, so Capone, a couple of Capone's granddaughters are still living out in California, and um, you know, Sonny, uh, I think much to his wife, much to May's credit, um, Al's wife did a good, really good job of sheltering Sonny from the criminal world that, that, that her husband, and, and May was also um, very shy and, and really wanted no part of, of any of the, uh, the life that her husband was living, except for the money. She, she took the money. Yes, sir. Uh, what year was penicillin discovered? Um, that's a good question. I'm pretty sure it was in the... Ooh, uh, I used to know that. Um, it was later. Um, they had a cure for syphilis uh, when Capone was first diagnosed. Um, and again, my memory is shaky on the name of it, but there was a, there was a medicine that he could have taken that would have um, cured his, his, um, his syphilis at an early age, but he did not receive that treatment. So uh, he, he could have, if he, if he decided to get it treated earlier, he could have saved himself a lot of trouble. 28, uh, penicillin, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, let me address the St. Valentine's Day Massacre because this is controversial, and um, I don't claim to know the, the answer, but first of all, just superficially, if you look at, 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 at the reasons why it, it's unlikely, I'll tell you my theory for what I think happened there, and again, it's only a theory, but Capone, by 29, had the IRS and the FBI breathing down his neck. He was being followed everywhere he went. He was also pretty much in complete control of the business in Chicago, had made enough money. He was not warring with the other gangs anymore. Um, the, the, the motivation in, in the gang, in the attack on the Valentine's Massacre was to kill Bugs Moran, who was running a lot of the North Side booze business. Um, but Capone wasn't really at war with Moran at that point, and Moran wasn't in the garage. If Capone wanted Moran dead, he knew where he lived, he knew where his offices were. And Capone, when he wanted somebody dead, like when Jaime wanted Jaime Weiss dead, he knew he sent a guy to stay in the, uh, across the street, rent a room across the street from Jaime Weiss's place, wait till he comes out and shoot him. It was very easy, and it worked every time. Why would he change his MO at, when he knows that he's under investigation by the FBI and the IRS, and why would he go in there and kill seven people? He never killed innocent bystanders before, and miss the main target of his... So I would argue that Moran was not the target of that. Somebody else must have been. And I've been, I was a crime reporter early in my career. If you've ever been a police officer, if, you, if you've had anything to do with crime, or if you just watch CSI, 90% um, of the time, the most likely suspect is the person closest to the dead person, right? It's, it's the wife, it's the spurned lover, it's the it's the, it's the angry business partner. It's somebody who has, who's angry. That doesn't take a genius. So um, what I suspect may have happened in the garage, I found a letter in the FBI archives from a, a guy who said, I was, invest I was working as a private investigator at the time. I know who, who solved the Valentine's Day Massacre. All right, well, a lot of people think they know who solved the Valentine's Day Massacre, but I, I looked at it and I checked it out anyway. He says that because it was such a bizarre theory with names I'd never heard of that it struck me as interesting. He says, a, a, a firefighter got into a bar fight with two of the guys from Moran's gang, the Gusenberg brothers. And they get into a bar fight, they kill this firefighter. They dump his body over on Hubbard Street. And the firefighter's father is a cop. The firefighter's cousin is one of the most notorious killers in Chicago. The notorious killer is seeking revenge for the death of his, of his cousin, 
He gets help from the Chicago Police Department because this is the son of a cop who's been killed. They borrow some police uniforms, they borrow police cars, they go after the Gusenberg boys, they line them up in the garage, they kill everybody in the garage. And um, the guy who was supposedly organized this, a guy named Three Finger Jack White, um, is, is, is identified in this letter as the, as the real organizer of the Valentine's Day Massacre. Um, there was also an eyewitness report from witnesses on Clark Street that day who said they saw a guy driving the car who was missing a finger. Well, that would be four-fingered Jack White, but maybe he was missing two fingers and the guy, you know, the witness wasn't clear on that. But anyway, there's enough there to suspect that that's, that's a possible theory. Um, also worth noting that when um, one of the boys in the garage um, lived long enough, the police arrived, he was able to give a statement. His statement was the cops did it. And sure enough, witnesses on the street saw people dressed as police officers going in and out of the garage. So some of the details match up with some of the details in that letter. Um, I suspect Capone was in Florida at the time. He could have given the order. But if, if Capone had any tie to it, they would have loved to have taken him in for it. They, would have, they never even questioned him on it. So I, I, I have a lot of trouble believing that Capone was, was involved in the Valentine's Day Massacre. Yes, sir. Yeah, Capone had a couple brothers. Uh, his brother Ralph um, Bottles Capone was the one who had the most uh, business opportunities uh, in Chicago. He ran a lot of uh, casinos, a lot of gambling operations, really all over Chicago. And he carried on activities long after Capone was put away. So, um, yeah, the, the, the Capones continued to have, and their family, you know, relatives, uh, continued to have a presence in Chicago for a long time. Yeah, that is true. Um, Capone had a brother who moved away early on. His, I think he was maybe the oldest of the, of the Capone boys. Left home early um, and, and moved out west and, and um, became a marshal in a small town in Nebraska. And Capone was reunited with him uh, late in life. And, of course, the uh, newspaper loved that story about Capone's having a lawman. Yeah. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um, if he hadn't... Um, called all that attention to himself, then he probably would have gotten away with it a lot longer. He would have had to still deal with the other gangsters in Chicago, but, but he really put a target on his back. He, by, by, by seeking all that publicity, um, he made himself the symbol of, of prohibition and made himself um, a scapegoat, really. I think that you know, Hoover very clearly decided he wanted somebody to use him as, as an example, and Capone put that target on his back. Yes? Yeah, I think that is Billy Herman. I used to be confident of that, and, uh, and uh, that's Capone's uh, son next to him, and I, I think that might be Frank Nitti uh, uh, next to his son, but I'm not sure. I used to, again, these, I've, I've lost some of these memories. Gabby Hartnett, that's it, thank you, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, it, it, it may be that he was uh, firing blanks, but also maybe that his wife contracted the syphilis as well from him, and, and she may have become infertile. Um, so, uh, the boy had, had um, problems, um, partially deaf, and, and some people think that he may have been born with some, some difficulties because of the syphilis as well, but that's all pretty hard to prove. Yeah, it's always hard to tell. You know, there's, there's, everybody thinks that Capone lived here, slept here, ate here, drank here. He's like our, you know, Abraham Lincoln of the underworld. Um, and it's, it's really hard to know because he didn't leave much of a paper trail. I always tell people... You know, when, 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 if you check into a hotel in Davenport and they say, you know, this is the Capone suite, we used to stay here, don't pay extra for that. Um, because what happens is anybody that's got a building that dates to the 20s makes up some kind of a Capone-related story. Um, and it, unless you see a picture, unless you see a newspaper account that's contemporary, um, take it with a grain of salt. Again, I don't know. Um, you know, keep in mind that it was a pretty long distance to travel back then, so I don't think they were hanging out regularly out this way. But um, if, he, if, if, the, if he was passing by this way on a hunting trip or a fishing trip, uh, certainly possible. And, and these places all needed booze, so they were getting it from somewhere, which meant people were going to and from the city. Um, but my guess is Capone didn't make a, a whole bunch of those uh, beer runs himself. Yes, sir. Um, no, booze, prostitution, gambling, those are the, the, the big three. Uh, he was involved in the horse racing a little bit too. He had a stake in uh, Sportsman's Park. Um, so he was, he was in a diversified operation. Later got into the rackets a little bit. He was, tried to control like the dry cleaning racket, a um, couple other things, milk delivery. Um, 
So it's uh, you, you start to see the seeds of the mafia, really. It, they didn't call it the mafia in Capone's day. It was the outfit. Um, and they really um, didn't try to get into other businesses until it started to appear that, you know, maybe Prohibition, the gravy train, was going to come to an end and they had to think about other things. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming tonight, and I'll be happy to stick around and sign some books.